one day in the spring of 1925, my grandfather, Louis Shatkin, and I took a walk after lunch together. We went along Hope Street to Mar Rochambeau Avenue and turned back on Morris Avenue, arriving at Session Street, where there was a huge hole in the ground. I could see two yellow steam shovels in the dugout area. We stopped there, and my grandfather said to me, Talk to her. Do you know what this is going to be? I said no. And he said, this is going to be a new temple. And in this temple, synagogue, we will all sit and pray together. You and I and your grandma and your mommy and daddy and your sisters, we will all sit together. We won't have to sit separately anymore. In 1924, Sylvia Fane's grandfather, Louis Shatkin, was part of the second generation of Jews in Rhode Island, children of Jewish immigrants, like the Goldmans, the Laskers, and the Silvers. These families came to Providence from Eastern Europe during the late 1800s onwards. The children of these immigrants were remarkable in their drive, their achievements, and their determination to be Jews and Americans. Much of Temple Emmanuel's history is their history. Many of these immigrants settled in the north end of Providence, along Goddard Street, Charles Street, and Orme Street. They were retail merchants in clothing and dry goods and in small manufacturing. Some plied their trade with push carts. A few of their businesses, like Adler's Army and Navy Store, survive today. While the parents struggled to earn a living, their children went on to public schools and excelled. An emerging generation went on to college. They were men and women of action and optimism. More successful parents moved their families to better housing on the east side and into middle-class life with larger businesses or professional careers. One such successful professional was Philip Jocelyn, a lawyer and local politician, first Jewish speaker of the Rhode Island House of State Representatives and judge in the Rhode Island Superior Court. These successful young Americans were committed to traditional Judaism, attending services, observing holidays, active in synagogues. But they were not comfortable with orthodox practices, which represented the remnants of the world of the ghetto that their parents left behind in Europe. Instead, these modern Americans wanted a Judaism that was both modern and traditional, that observed halakha, and yet allowed English in the service and let men and women sit together in a service that was quiet and dignified. Thus, when Rabbi Cohen of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York sent a letter to Philip Jocelyn, quote, to see whether some plan cannot be formulated by which providence may be able to save itself for traditional Judaism, close quote, Jocelyn, Maurice Bliss, Charles Brown, and others were ready to answer this call for a new congregation. Philip Jocelyn moved quickly. Less than eight weeks after receiving Rabbi Cohen's letter, Jocelyn and his wife Dorothy were host at their home to 15 friends who shared their interests. Two weeks later, they gathered 50 families to meet with Rabbi Cohen. Four weeks later, they purchased a plot of land from the botanical gardens of Brown University on which to build a new synagogue. Four weeks after that, they signed the original Articles of Association establishing Temple Emanuel as a corporation. Quote, For the purpose of maintaining under free American institutions a house of worship for men, women, and children of the Hebrew faith, 
dedicated to God, to the tradition and ideals of Judaism, and to the spiritual, moral, and general welfare of its members, their families, and the community of which it shall be a part. Close quote. And this new congregation wanted a new temple building. Modern in appearance, like the new conservative Judaism they were embracing. Older synagogue buildings in Providence were based on an old world model, derived from study houses of Eastern Europe or adapted from existing buildings. Building chairman Sam McGid took several trips to interview architects and to look at modern architect designed synagogues. Between 1912 and 1925, variations on this design were rapidly incorporated into new synagogue architecture in Cleveland, San Antonio, and other cities. Providence New Synagogue would follow this model. For the interior, architects Crokin, Brown, and Rosenstein chose an axial plan, similar to other dome synagogues, which have the bima located in front, with the pews bent in an arc close to the bima. There would be a small balcony for extra seating, as in this Chicago temple, and the dome would arch over the entire sanctuary. The design was modern but authentic, new but with tradition and substantial. Even before the building plans were complete, the congregation planned their first high holiday services. They interviewed an advanced rabbinical student named Israel M. Goldman and invited him back to lead the first high holiday services in September 1925 in rented rooms at Churchill House and Froebel Hall on the campus of Brown University. 200 people attended. On May 23, 1926, one year after the first high holiday services and two years after purchasing the land, the founders held a groundbreaking ceremony for the new temple. Two months later, Jocelyn and the other leaders engaged the newly ordained Rabbi Goldman as their new spiritual leader. By September, even though the building was not complete, the new congregation was determined to hold services within the walls of the new vestry. Rabbi Goldman wrote, The floor was still in its rough cement stage. The walls were unplastered, and the steelwork, together with the lathing and bricks, were visible. Overhead, there was only a partial roof, so that it was necessary to place a huge tarpaulin covering to keep out the rain. Hangings were placed on the walls. Newspapers covered over with linoleum were placed on the damp floor. Flowers and palms adorned the platform and auditorium, and the services proceeded. At the end of the 1926 high holiday season, as the culmination of Sukkot week, the congregation celebrated the laying of the cornerstone. Hundreds of members and their guests gathered within the area of the new sanctuary, surrounded by partially erected walls and scaffolding. The dome was not yet built, and the crowd sat in coats and hats beneath the sky. On the temporary dais, dignitaries from the city and state sat next to temple board members. Displayed beneath them were the American and Jewish flags. The governor of Rhode Island welcomed what he called a, quote, new church, close quote, into the community and the other local dignitaries from the entire community, Jewish and Gentile, welcomed the new congregation. It was a perfect and exciting moment. By the next holiday season, on September 18, 1927, Temple Emanuel's new building was officially dedicated amidst great pomp and ceremony. Ma The congregation now had a spiritual and ritual center for worship and celebration. As they had hoped, the new temple was modern and majestic, an eloquent statement of a new, yet traditional Judaism. Abbot Lieberman remembers. Friday evening, Friday night services 
were an event, the event of the week. And you'd get anywhere from 400, maybe five, 600 people uh, to listen to Rabbi uh, Goldman. And there was always a, ser always a sermon and uh, it was an event. From Emmanuel's inception, educating the children and attracting them to Judaism were primary goals of the congregation. Less than a year after the first meetings to form the congregation, the religious school was officially underway with two programs, a Sunday school and a weekday after school Hebrew school. In 1927, the school board hoped to enroll 100 students in the school. By 1929, there were 330 pupils taking classes. By 1930, 463 students. By 1956, there were nearly 800 pupils. Temple Emmanuel opened its doors to Jewish children who lacked Jewish education. From the 1930s until it closed, Children from the Jewish orphanage of Rhode Island attended the Sunday school, as did children from Attleboro and Pawtucket. Instead of old-style private study with a Hebrew teacher, a Malamud, or attending a Talmud Torah school, the school board and Rabbi Goldman transformed this educational experience. In the Sunday school, children would learn the joys of tradition through stories, celebrations, crafts, music, plays, and performances. They insisted on a modern classroom style to teach Hebrew for bar and bat mitzvah and as a living spoken language. Learning the rituals of worship together. Putting on tefillin in the bar mitzvah brotherhood. Friday night gatherings, school assemblies, youth activities including clubs, oratorical contests, and special Shabbat services, all as a part of the educational experience. Many students engaged in host bar and bat mitzvah classes to study sacred texts, Jewish history, and current events. The curriculum culminated in a joyful confirmation ceremony at age 16. Phyllis Brown remembers. Confirmation was a very exciting time. It was the service, the Shavuos. It took over Shavuos and the girls were all dressed in white. Uh, and the, the, we had a valedictorian. We had uh, uh, the, whole, the whole thing. And then in the evening, uh, we had open houses, and everybody went to everybody else's open house, except, of course, the host and hostess. And groups would go from, from place to place. As early as 1934, the school board initiated a school building fund with a donation of $1,000, calling for, quote, not just a few new classrooms, but a building large enough to accommodate every need in Jewish education. Architects Baker and Turoff drew the plans that included a gymnasium, an auditorium, classrooms, and more. But the Depression and World War II prevented construction. Finally, in 1952, a new education building was approved. Groundbreaking and construction proceeded rapidly. By the high holiday season of 1953, services could be held in the new auditorium, which came to be called the New Synagogue. With this second building, another phase of the Founders' dream was realized. Now, in the mid-1950s, with a beautiful sanctuary, an education building, and a growing membership, Emmanuel's leaders were ready to consider a third pillar for their temple, a full and busy calendar of social events and service to the community and the temple led to this third pillar. As early as 1928, the annual ball was a regular event. 
Major American holidays were celebrated too, especially the annual Thanksgiving Ball, where Emanuelites in glittering formal attire would dance to the music of two orchestras until 1 a.m. The Sisterhood, created in 1924, and the Men's Club, formed in 1928, were at the heart of Emanuel's social life. The Sisterhood sponsored luncheons, dinners, pageants, and breakfast events. The men's club shared the kitchen, sponsoring their own breakfasts, sometimes with invited guests, like Senator Pastore, as well as a theatrical event, a bowling league, and a glee club. Sometimes working together, the Sisterhood and the men's club sponsored plays, recreational activities, anniversary celebrations, and major fundraisers, such as the carnivals, which raised funds to pay off the mortgage of the main sanctuary. In 1929, Rabbi Goldman began the Institute of Jewish Studies for Adults with a schedule of lectures and classes. The registration fee was $2.00. Lectures by the rabbi and guest speakers became a regular part of Emmanuel's programming, including well-known Jewish scholars and leaders like Rabbi Mordechai Kaplan, and lay leaders including Francis Perkins, Eleanor Roosevelt, political leaders, and controversial figures like Julian Bond. The congregation also gathered to mark world events in 1934, Judge Joslin presided over a mock trial of the case of civilization against Hitlerism. Rabbi Goldman presented jury's indictment. Judge Joslin found the Nazis guilty. Quickening pace of world events did not preclude recognition and celebration of temple milestones. In the same sanctuary where the rabbi's 15th anniversary was celebrated, the congregation gathered during the World War to say collective Kaddish for the victims of Nazism, to pray for the success of the Normandy invasions, and to mourn the death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The congregation nurtured its commitment to civic and patriotic service. In 1928, a Boy Scout troop was established. When the school board heard that Jewish textbooks and siddurs were needed by a congregation in India, the teachers and children collected and sent the needed books. In return, the Indian congregation gave Emmanuel a beautiful shofar, which is kept in the museum. The civic and patriotic commitments of the congregation came to the fore during World War II. Jenny Klein remembers. These were war years. I don't know how many of you remember, but Providence was one of the blackout towns in the United States. We were completely in the dark every evening. Nothing, no light was allowed on any place. And we had a big Hebrew school in those days. And we didn't leave the building till six o'clock at night. Class lasted till then. So when the children would have to go out, it would be completely dark. We decided we had to have something for the children in case we were stuck in the building. So we bought matzo and crackers and peanut butter. A war work committee sold war bonds and the men's club sold enough war bonds to support the purchase of a B-17 bomber, Temple Emanuel's Flying Fortress. The Sisterhood held clothing drives and sent letters, packages, and kits with religious items to enlisted temple members around the world. With all of this activity, space was once again a problem. Annual meetings in formal dress were on occasion held in the basement of President Joslin's house. Large social events had to be held at hired halls, especially the Narragansett Hotel. Barely a year after the school building was completed, the board agreed to plan for the third pillar of the temple, a social hall. Temple member and architectural engineer Henry W. Markoff made preliminary sketches and plans for the new building. 
and another building campaign was underway. Markov later worked with noted architect Percival Goodman to design the new building to blend with the outer style of the main building, but with a contemporary interior. Groundbreaking took place on May 4, 1958, and the building was completed by November 1959. The new building, with its contemporary interior, had space for all of Emmanuel's social needs. A large social hall, a fully equipped kitchen, a bride's room, a bar, a foyer, a patio, and a museum. The first American synagogue-based museum of Jewish objects and arts, nurtured by Natalie Persillet and the generosity of Emmanuel members. With the completion of the social building, named the Alperin Meeting House to honor temple president and benefactor Max Alperin, the three pillars of Temple Emmanuel were in place. Temple Emmanuel today seems very different from what the founders anticipated. Once, women were not allowed on the bima. Today, women serve as equal partners in synagogue life, counting in the minyan, taking aliyot, and serving as presidents. Once, children were not allowed in the sanctuary for services. Today, children attend every service, and our teens may lead a service. Once, decorum and quietness dominated the service. Today, joyful participation is more the rule. With these changes, we know that the Founders' vision of a modern and traditional Judaism is still with us. In 1927, Rabbi Goldman wrote this for the dedication ceremony. Today, we celebrate the Temple Beautiful. Judaism is a living faith and lives forever. For centuries, despite the greatest adversity, Judaism has gone from strength to strength. For centuries, Jews have erected synagogues to serve the threefold purpose of a house of worship, a house of study, and a house of assembly. Today, it is our exalting privilege to continue in this noble tradition of our fathers. This day, we dedicate a new home for the ever-abiding Jewish spirit. Blessed are they who are the builders. Blessed are ye who come in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the house of Israel who will come into this house of God. Let us rejoice in this day. Indeed, in the words of our immortal leader Moses, we will go with our young and with our old, with our sons and with our daughters, for it is a festival unto the Lord. <laughs> 